Welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Silvia Peregrino. I'm an associate professor of government here at, at Paso Community College. And this is Entre Nosotras, Latina Voices. Uh, today, we're honored to have our first guest, uh, State Representative Cesar Blanco uh, from House District 76. Uh, Representative Blanco is currently running uh, for the seat vacated by uh, Senator Jose Rodriguez. And so he's running for Senate District 29. Uh, and uh, we want to welcome our first guest. Welcome, Representative Blanco. Thank you, Dr. Peregrino. Great to be here on the show. Great. Uh, so first of all, could you start by telling us a little bit about your background for our viewers? Sure. So I, um, I'm a product of El Paso, uh, El Paso Public Schools. I grew up here, uh, graduated from Eastwood High School. Um, following my graduation, um, I was working and uh, part-time and going to UTEP. Uh, and then I decided to enlist in the in the United States Navy, and I served in the United States Navy for a little over six years. Uh, two jobs that I had in the Navy was uh, air defense uh, was my first tour, um, and then my second tour uh, was uh, military intelligence, and uh, gave me a great opportunity, great experiences uh, to serve my country. And then I came home, uh, back home to El Paso, and attended UTEP using the GI Bill and received my Bachelor's uh, uh, of Arts in Political Science uh, with the Political Science Department at UTEP. And then, um, you know, spent many years uh, working for several members of Congress, uh, Congressman Silvestre Reyes. Uh, I worked as a, a caseworker and a field representative. Then I had an opportunity to work for Congressman Ciro Rodriguez, uh, and I kind of moved up the ranks with Congressman Ciro Rodriguez all the way up to, to becoming his chief of staff in Washington, D.C. And then, um, you know, I had a variety of other positions uh, with Congressman uh, Pete Gallego, serving him as his chief of staff. And I worked at the Democratic National Committee as the uh, Western States political director, which was a really exciting uh, position because whenever President Obama, uh, the First Lady, or any of the cabinet uh, uh, secretary members would travel to the states that I had uh, oversight, all the Western states from Texas all the way to Alaska, um, I would travel, I would staff uh, the President of the United States, uh, write the political briefing memos for the President, and uh, really get pro part of that process. So it was really exciting times to, to be uh, living and working in Washington, D.C. Um, and then I came home, uh, decided that uh, I wanted to serve my community, continue to serve my community in El Paso, using my skills and my strengths that I had learned uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., and apply them for the betterment of my community. So uh, I came back home and I decided uh, to run. Uh, part of it was frustration uh, with the direction of our community. And um, at, at some point, you can only complain uh, and not take action. And I decided to, to run for office. And, uh, and so I've been serving in, in the legislature. Uh, I'm on my sixth year uh, as a state representative. And as you had indicated, uh, our state senator, Jose Rodriguez, who did a great job representing us in, in Austin at the state capitol, decided to retire. And I decided to throw my hat in the race and, uh, and now running for state senate, uh, which uh, is a pretty large district. So uh, that's a little bit about my, my background. Since we're talking about this, uh, tell us about uh, Senate District 29. So Senate District 29 is very diverse. It's very big. Uh, it covers five counties, starting from El Paso County, Hudspeth County, Culberson County, Jeff Davis County, and Presidio County. Uh, so it's a very large district, and um, you know, on the western part uh, of, of the of the uh, district is El Paso, which is very urban, um, and then the, the eastern part of the district is very rural. So there are a lot of different challenges uh, from El Paso to the other parts of the district. Uh, in, in the eastern part of the district, uh, out there by Presidio and Marfa and Jeff Davis, uh, Culberson, uh, you know, Van Horn and Sierra Blanca and Fort Hancock, uh, they're dealing with issues of agriculture. They're dealing with uh, rural issues, uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure, um, health care, access to health care issues that, that may be different from El Paso. Or here in El Paso, we're dealing with uh, uh, things like trade transportation uh, uh, infrastructure within our city so that our cities aren't as congested with vehicles. Um, so uh, pretty diverse, but exciting to be able to uh, hopefully dive in and, and help solve some problems for, for 
West Texas. In your time in the state legislature, what has been your three biggest accomplishments? What are you most proud of? Some of the things that, that I'm proud of, uh, uh, during my freshman term, uh, legislators tried to eliminate a veterans educational benefit called the Hazelwood Act. Um, the Hazelwood Act provides veterans who enlisted uh, from Texas the opportunity to utilize uh, free tuition in uh, state institutions or community colleges. And um, it allows the veteran to utilize them themselves or pass it on to their spouse or to their children. Um, and the concern was that legislators had was that it was gonna be too expensive, even though the legislature ha have never paid uh, into the program to reimburse community colleges or universities. So there was a big movement to eliminate the program specifically for dependents of veterans. Now, the Hazelwood is a promise uh, that the state legislature made to veterans. And the legislators uh, who proposed this bill wanted to go back on that promise. So I uh, debated uh, for, for a few hours on the House floor uh, the importance of keeping this promise to our veterans. Um, when you look at the data, uh, most of the recipients, specifically the dependents of veterans that utilize Hazelwood, they finish faster uh, than the average student at, at colleges and universities. Uh, they end up finishing three and a half years. Separate from that, the utilizer of Hazelwood, women. Women are the, the largest utilizer of Hazelwood. And then the other part of that is, guess where they go? Uh, most of those graduates end up staying in Texas utilizing their degrees. So at the, at the back end of the program, it's very beneficial for our state because we get educated workforce that stay here in, in Texas who are women. And um, so it's important to, to protect that benefit. Uh, I was successful in, in, in convincing our colleagues on both sides of the aisle that that benefit is important, uh, not only for our veterans, but it keeps the promise for our veterans and it keeps uh, uh, educated workforce here in Texas. So I, I, I'm happy to, to be the one that, that helped protected, uh, you know, to help protect that veterans benefit for, for years to come. You know, other uh, things uh, that I'm really excited about, this last legislative session we passed House Bill 3, uh, which is, has been a really a transformational uh, funding uh, for our school, public schools in Texas. Uh, we put in several billion dollars uh, where the state over the last uh, 20 to 30 years hadn't sufficiently funded our public schools in a way that we did this last legislative session. Um, you know, we put $4.5 billion into schools, $5 billion into paying down the property taxes, and then an additional $2 uh, uh, billion for uh, dynamic pay raises. And then separately, we, through SB 12, we shored up the teacher retirement system to allow retired teachers to receive a 13th paycheck on average in the state uh, of about $2,000. You know, I, I'm a product of El Paso Public Schools, both in EPISD and Isleta ISD, and uh, uh, education is our society's greatest equalizer. And the fact that uh, the state had neglected for many years not to put important resources into public, public schools demonstrates where the state's priorities uh, uh, are. Uh, but this last legislative session, we put money into there. We raised the state's share uh, that was in the 30 percentile uh, up to the 40 percentile. Uh, I think we should do more. Next legislative session, we're gonna go back to the table to, to fund uh, education again. Um, as a Democrat, I think we should be funding uh, what our Constitution in, uh, tells us, uh, and I think we should be funding more. Uh, it helps our community, it helps our kids, it's uh, educating our future workforce in Texas. And then separately from that, when you look at the tax base and what uh, when you look at the taxpayer dollar in terms of property taxes, the greatest share of that dollar are our school districts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we want to reduce the property uh, taxes, Texas could pay into uh, that, that piece and pay its fair share to, to fund our public schools. Um, and we saw this la last legislative session, and I think we should continue to, to do that. So really proud that that bill passed. It was a bipartisan bill uh, focusing on our kids. 
and uh, I'm hopeful that we can do that again next session. The other, uh, the third item uh, is bringing back home resources for El Paso. Uh, this delegation, um, uh, there are six of us in this delegation, uh, five state representatives and one state senator, and we really work hard to bring home resources uh, specifically for UTEP, El Paso Community College, and Texas Tech uh, um, Medical School, Dental School, and the Health Sciences Center at Texas Tech. Um, we brought in uh, $20 million for the uh, um, uh, dental school that will be starting uh, here in, in, in El Paso, and as well as the medical school, the Paul uh, L. Foster Medical school, school of Medicine here in El Paso. Think about it. The kids at Jefferson High School can literally look across the street and know that they could apply and potentially get accepted to the medical school here in El Paso or a dental school here in El Paso. If, uh, if our kids in El Paso uh, want to go to uh, become pharmacists, they could go to UTEP Pharmacy School and become pharmacists. Um, and, or if they want to uh, start at the El Paso Community College or get a trade at the El Paso Community College, they can do so here in our community. So, so important that our delegation is working together to bring hundreds of millions of dollars to El Paso uh, to, to help our youth uh, be productive citizens uh, in our community. The, the ripple effect of that is that we're helping our, our healthcare shortage here in El Paso. We don't have enough doctors, dentists, nurses, uh, pharmacists to provide quality care in our communities. And the idea of elected officials along with our business community who are philanthropists who are who are giving their own money into these higher education institutions, we're partnering uh, to making sure that El Paso as a community benefits uh, with greater access to healthcare. So really proud of that third item to be part of uh, uh, that team of elected officials, philanthropists, and educators uh, to help our community move forward. Those are wonderful accomplishments. I, I also wanted to add, uh, because usually I have my students do a report about their their state legislators so that they know about it. So I remember you were recognized at the state level with Texas Monthly naming you one of the best uh, legislators and you did that as a freshman, as a brand new legislator. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're proud of that uh, for for having you um, put our city in a, in a bright light. Thank you. Uh, and then, you know, you also mentioned uh, the money I was curious, is that a one-time thing? Because, you know, perhaps our retirees want to know if that's, uh, if that extra check will be a one-time thing or if it's something that's going to be every... So, so uh, the idea was to um, infuse state dollars to making sure that the teacher retirement system I is solvent. Um, and we did that this last legislative session. Uh, but we also wanted to give a 13th paycheck uh, this session. It is a one-time... Uh, 13th paycheck, uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't go next legislative session and identifying ways to making sure that, um, that, that retired teachers have an opportunity because uh, things become expensive. You know, property taxes go up. Uh, the cost of prescri prescription drugs go up. Healthcare is not cheap. Uh, gasoline prices uh, continue to increase. So we want to make sure that we're, we're taking care of our retired teachers as well um, you know, I've got a, a sister who uh, has spent many years as an educator in El Paso Independent School District, and she tells me firsthand, um, not only as a teacher, uh, how much she spends uh, annually in the classroom buying pencils, notebooks, and things that the students may not be able to afford. That's money out of the pockets of teachers uh, while they're teaching. Um, that's all money that could be saved, right, uh, while they're teachers for their retirement, but they put in money because a lot of times the kids don't have those type of resources. But when they retire, I think it's our responsibility to, to help them, um, and I think that 13th paycheck was helpful. So we're going to go back this next legislative session, take a look at it, and hopefully find the monies to, to do the same again. And I see that firsthand here at the college in that we have a lot of, of teachers that retire, and they're allowed to teach... Uh, two classes for us part-time mm -hmm. and a lot of them can't um, live off their retirement and so uh, or they still have a passion for for teaching so they come in and help us out here with our with our students so that's that's great I I were also in the TRS and so right. it was good to hear uh, about the fact that it's going to be around for for the future and then mm -hmm. 
Um, going back to uh, to the fact that you mentioned that we had increased uh, to forty percent, like the percentage mm -hmm. of the of what the state's kicking into the public school system, because as you mentioned, that is the biggest share of of our property taxes. Mm -hmm. The school districts get the biggest share. Uh, do you see that in the future increasing, or or what was it before? Because I I feel like it's um, you know tuition has gone up. I feel also that maybe the state's commitment to public schools uh, has has decreased. It has. We historically we've seen a decrease uh, at the state level to invest in our public schools, and it's unfortunate. Um, I think that again, education is society's greatest equalizer. We should be doing everything and more to making sure that our children, who will be our future workforce, have an opportunity to have good quality schools, classrooms, teachers, uh, everything at their at their disposal to be successful in life. But we historically, we haven't seen that investment at the state level. Uh, we changed that uh, this last legislative session, and I'm hopeful that it's an upward tra trajectory uh, rather than a, a decrease. Uh, I think that that if anywhere we can make investments, um, uh, our, our kids in our public schools are a great investment to make, which would have a, a, a great return on our investment. You also mentioned uh, some of the higher education opportunities that the legislators, um, our, our uh, representatives, including yourselves, have been able to bring uh, to the state. I just wanted to put a plug for uh, EPCC also has an architecture program mm -hmm. that we've partnered with Texas Tech, right. and so we're uh, now the students don't have to go all the way to Lubbock; uh, right. they could finish here as well. Absolutely, um, the idea is to to to, to grow our own professionals uh, from a variety of perspectives that complement our economy, our needs, um, to making sure that our our community and our region is self-sufficient. We're kind of by ourselves out here uh, in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico. Um, and then including Juarez, right? El Juarez is, is, is way up north in Mexico. We need to think in terms of region. Uh, we need to think in terms of how do we make our region uh, competitive, uh, not, not just uh, from, from a national standpoint, but from a global standpoint. And when we want to uh, bring in companies uh, to invest, to set up shop here in our region, uh, those companies look at their workforce, they look at um, our, our uh, location in our region in terms of trade, uh, which is this is one of the largest metroplex in the world that's international. Uh, they look at healthcare, they look at their schools, they look at education, uh, educational attainment levels. So we wanna make sure that we as elected officials are doing everything that we can to make our region competitive um, so that we can uh, recruit more industry into our region. So I think, uh, making those investments in public education, making those investments in higher education with, with the view of what those benefits are for our community regionally and how it makes us more competitive, I think is key. Speaking about higher education, uh, in terms of uh, the cost for tuition, um, I know here at the college, um, the percentage of, of funding that comes to us from the state has decreased over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, we do still try to maintain a, a competitive uh, affordable, uh, high quality education. But I know uh, UTEP and other universities every other year tend to in increase uh, their their uh, tuition costs. I know the legislature in 2003 gave them permission to set their own tuition costs. Is there a move to rein that back in with uh, having the legislature take that over or or more funding for for the public uh, for the higher education. Sure, I think it's a it's a huge barrier, right? We're seeing um, uh, folks living with their parents longer because of of the cost of higher education. Um, and you're right. Uh, before my time in the legislature, they deregulated tuition. Uh, since then, we've seen uh, a, a drastic increase in the cost of of obtaining the higher education. It used to be that someone could go to college. Um, utilize financial aid, scholarships, or pay out of pocket, work a part-time job and also pay, um, you'd get out of college and you wouldn't be in so much debt. You'd be in some debt, but it would be manageable. Um, now, students are coming out and, and they can't even go and buy a car, um, a home, and things like that. They'd have to wait some time, um, get into a profession, and then, and then uh, work their way out of their parents' home uh, before they can be self-sufficient. Uh, I don't think that helps us. Um, so 
next legislative session, uh, the legislators have been talking that it may be a higher education uh, legislative session, among other things like redistricting, uh, fully funding public schools, uh, et cetera. But uh, it could be a higher education, and we could look at that. We could look at uh, uh, the cost of tuition, home, um, and I'm hopeful that we can because we want to make know, sure that should, if you graduated from uh, the El Paso Community College or UTEP or Texas Tech, and, and uh, think, that you have an ability uh, to, to get into gainful employment and not be in so some much of those, debt. Uh, I know that changes. I bring that up uh, to students that usually, typically, uh, in the U.S., the typical undergrad owes about $29,000. Mm -hmm. And if they go to graduate school or professional school, uh, it's in the hundreds of thousands, right. and so definitely a good a good area to go to. And so, speaking of that, uh, if elected uh, state senator, what would be your top three priorities for the 2021 legislative session? So, I think uh, continuing to build on our higher education portfolio, making sure that the resources are available there. Uh, we have a brand new dental school uh, uh, that's that's uh, beginning. Uh, we want to make sure that we have an ability to to secure resources for more buildings. Uh, at UTEP, EPCC, and Texas Tech, making sure that, uh, that we're competitive with other universities, with state-of-the-art classrooms and laboratories, um, uh, making sure that there's great office spaces for, uh, for the recruitment of quality uh, instructors and professors. Uh, so really focusing on higher education and making sure that, that El Paso receives its fair share of those higher education dollars are a huge priority. Uh, we need to go back and fund uh, our public schools. Uh, we wanna, we're gonna take another uh, crack at that next legislative session because this last session, we only funded up to this biennium, so that expires. So we need to go back and look at those for, uh, funding formulas and put more money into it. I'm hopeful. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the state budget. Uh, it looks promising uh, for the next biennium, hopefully. And uh, I think that because we're going to have a good budget year, we, we should be able to come back and, and, and make those uh, investments both in, in public education and higher education. Um, the other thing is infrastructure. You know, our roads, our bridges here in El Paso, I know uh, our community is growing, which is a good thing. But uh, uh, the investment in our roads uh, has to accompany that growth in our community. And I want to make sure that... Uh, that in the state senate, uh, we're looking at making those investments into the Texas Department of Transportation, that, that El Paso is receiving its fair share of transportation dollars. Uh, when you look at the state of Texas, you have the I-35 corridor that goes through San Antonio, Austin, all the way up to Dallas, and everything east of that receives a lot of money in transportation dollars. Uh, but when you look at the western part of, of, of that corridor, uh, I would argue that we don't receive our fair share. So it is my hope to be able to, to work hard in the state Senate to secure those, those uh, infrastructure dollars because we need them. Uh, we have several ports of entry here in El Paso where we have trucks uh, that are coming in from Mexico that are idling at our ports of entry that have a, a, a negative effect on our environment. We wanna make sure that uh, we continue to secure uh, dollars like this last legislative session, this delegation secured uh, over $30 million for the, uh, uh, I, it's called ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, to making sure that our ports of entry are receiving trade, but we're getting those trucks uh, to pass in a fast, secure manner. So more investments in those type of uh, technologies in transportation, uh, because trade is, is, is part of our lifeblood here in, in, uh, in our region. Um, and then making sure that, that, uh, that, that our, our highways here in El Paso are able to absorb that trade uh, so there's no bottlenecks in our communities and our neighborhoods and making sure that uh, those transportation dollars are there. Uh, you look at our, our interstate here in El Paso, I-10. When you drive through I-10, you can see, literally see, the street, the, the highway splitting. Uh, if we're gonna be competitive uh, from a global perspective, we want to make sure that our highways are, are resurfaced um, and that they're safe uh, and that they're wider so that uh, we can accommodate trade and, and, and our transportation, um, uh, folks that are trans traveling through our, through our roads are safe. So securing transportation dollars and our fair transportation dollars is gonna be key. So we're coming uh, to, to the point where we're running out of time okay. for, for the first uh, inaugural show. 
Uh, however, we do want to continue the conversation, and so uh, we'll have part two of our interview with uh, Representative Cesar Blanco, who's running for, for State Senate. I do want to remind uh, the audience, the viewers, that early voting is coming up uh, February 18th through uh, February 28th, and so you can find uh, the early voting location uh, through El Paso, epcountyvotes.com. Uh, they also have an app. And then election day is March 3rd. And so uh, if you like what you hear from Representative Blanco, uh, be sure to vote for him in the primary, uh, which is coming up, uh, the Democratic primary. And then uh, he'll be facing an opponent uh, in, in November um, from the Republican Party uh, representative uh, or Mrs. Hatch. And so we hope to have her in the, audio, in the show in the future so you could hear from uh, from the candidates or perhaps get them to debate. Uh, and so this concludes our, our first show. Representative Cesar Blanco, thank you so much thank for, you, for letting us know uh, what's going on in the legislature and it's, good luck. It's great to be here, thank you. Thank you.